everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Generative AI, Understanding the Value Across Business Functions. I'm your host, Deborah Aho Williamson. I'm a principal analyst at Insider Intelligence, and I'm coming to you live from our global headquarters in New York City. I'm joined by my colleague, senior analyst Max Willens today. Max is based in Philadelphia. Hey, Max, it's really great to see you. Good to see you, Debbie. Thanks so much. It's going to be a really awesome presentation. Before we get into that, I'd also like to thank Yext for making today's webinar possible. And I'd like to welcome Christian Ward, who's Chief Data Officer of Yext. He's joining us from Florida. Hey, Christian. Hey, Debbie. Thank you for having me. Really happy to have you as well. But a few things before we dive into Max's presentation. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes because after the recording, we'll be sending you a link to view the full slides and the full presentation. But before we, before we get going, but we do want you to participate. So please use the chat window on the right side to submit questions at any time. We'll get to as many of them as possible. And I know with a topic like generative AI, there's gonna be a lot of questions. But without further ado, Max, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks, Debbie. And thank you all again for, for being here. Um, I'm very excited to sort of unpack all of this with all of you. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I was on the eMarketer Behind the Numbers podcast and was asked to sort of list my top trends for 2023. And I quite easily said that AI would be at the top of the list. And even with that mindset, I've been quite surprised by just how much momentum has built behind this technology, not just in media and advertising, which is my core area of focus, but really just across business uh, full stop, which means that we have quite a lot to get to today. We will start with some user numbers. Uh, we have a fresh forecast that we can dive into together. Uh, we're also going to look at user attitudes because I think that even though this presentation is focused on you know business uses, consumer attitudes toward this technology really do matter quite a bit. And we'll kind of reflect on that as the presentation progresses. We'll also look at the business uses, uh, not just the current ones, but the sort of near term ones. Those of you that are on this call and know our, our brand and what we do know that, you know, we're not going to tell you what's going to happen in 2050. We're not even in this case going to tell you what's going to happen in 2030 because this technology is too new. Things are moving too quickly. And also because there are some notable and significant uh, hurdles and obstacles that need to be uh contended with and, and reflected on if we are going to understand the trajectory this technology is going to take. But let's let's dive into the big numbers, shall we? So like I said, this is from a forecast that my colleagues published in June. And by our estimation, about a quarter of US internet users are going to be generative AI users this year. That's nearly 78 million people, uh, which is 10 times the number that we're using it in 2022. By next year, it's going to be about one in three U.S. internet users and four in 10 in 2025. And as crazy as these numbers are, I think they actually kind of undersell the adoption of this technology. Uh, Gen AI has quickly become a global phenomenon. If you look at a market like China or a market like India, you'll see almost an equally enthusiastic embrace of this technology um, across different sectors of their economy. And so... These are big numbers, but there are still bigger ones if you think about this globally. Um, but what's important to remember about this technology um, and think about is not so much the number of people using it, but where they are using it. So in case those of you didn't instantly memorize the numbers from the previous slide, I'll just contextualize these uh, a little bit. So right now, we expect about 45 million people will use Gen AI at the office this year or you know, in their offices at home. Uh, that's about 58% of the Gen AI users overall. And as uh, overall Gen AI penetration climbs, the uh, share of people using it at work is going to climb too. So like I said, we're looking at about 58% this year. It's going to climb to about 65% next year, and it'll be north of 70% the year after that. Um, and I just want to underline how unusual this is for an emerging digital technology. Uh, AI is different from lots of new tech, and obviously the context of its, you know, hitting our lives is is unique. But I think it's really important to kind of dig into how diffuse this technology has grown already. So this is another piece of that same forecast that I alluded to. There's lots of really fun data points in here, but to me, the most fun is the third bullet point at the left here, which just shows that there are more 55 to 64 year olds using this technology than there are 12 to 17 year olds. And, you know, think about that in comparison to 
something like the adoption of social media or the adoption of streaming video and how completely different that is. And if you look at these bars, uh, another way what you what quickly leaps out at you is how many of these people are working age. Uh, about half of our, uh, by our estimations, half the people using Gen AI are in what are considered prime working years. And this kind of diffuse adoption of a technology, uh, especially one as, as kind of momentous as this one, is really doesn't have much precedent. Um, so, you know, at first blush, if you look at this chart at the right, which was produced by a colleague for a different presentation, you would say this is a picture of an apple and two oranges. You know, you've got the adoption of a free to use consumer technology that's available online and the adoption of hardware devices that in most cases cost hundreds of dollars. Um, but I, I bring this up not just to sort of contextualize the, the spike of, of Gen AI adoption, but also to sort of talk about how important context is. So I feel quite confident that everybody watching this presentation owns a smartphone. And I'm equally confident that a good chunk of you own tablets, but maybe not as many as own smartphones. And those of you that do own them probably don't use them that often or not certainly not as often as you use your smartphones. Um, but if you were to show this slide to somebody who, you know, teleported in from another dimension or an, an alien, they would presume the opposite. They would think, well, the smartphone adoption was much steadier and much uh, more gradual than tablets. So surely tablets are more popular. But it was that slow and steady adoption and the presence of smartphones that enabled uh, tablet usage to take off in the early years. It allowed people to watch Steve Jobs unveil the iPad and instantly go, oh, I get it. It's the same touch screen, the same connectivity, but it's a bigger screen so I can read more. I can play games more intently. It's easier for me to watch video if I want to. And I think that that's really important when you think about the rapid adoption of generative AI even though it seems like science fiction technology a little bit, it seems like it sort of comes out of the blue and it did spread quickly. All of us have had years of engaging with chatbots in working with jobs that require us to produce lots of copy or where we have learned that uh, personalization is really important and personalizing digital experiences is really important. And having that kind of familiarity and that mindset allowed millions and millions of people literally to sort of see ChatGPT, for example, or any other Gen AI interface and instantly go, oh, I can use this. I understand what this is for. And that's powerful and it, it has uh, really big uh, implications. But I, I do also want to talk a little bit about what it means that this has been adopted so quickly and has become part of our lives so fast. Mm -hmm. Well, so, hey, Max, you know, before you move on, I think it, it's really interesting context also. I was just thinking about what you were saying about uh, the growth of social media uh, a slide or two back. And uh, I cover social media here at Insider Intelligence. And I remember the early days uh, back in 2005, uh, which was just one year after Facebook launched, uh, we saw a, re a research study from, I think it was uh, Pew Research Center, where only 5% of US adults at that point were using a social network. And the increase in the first year was only to about 11%. And uh, what you just showed us with generative AI and the growth of generative AI was really astounding. Um, I, I was just kind of, I said to pause and think about that for a second, because because I, I remember social media being such a transformative and still is a transformative thing, but generative AI seems to be really on a different level. And uh, your, your analogy to teleporting in from a different planet, I think is really resonant with me because I feel like what's happening with generative AI is also kind of taking us to a totally different planet and different places that we've probably never been able to go um, in terms of getting information and um, being able to use it for so many things. It was just really fascinating. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in here that I think every time I look at these slides, and I've spent a bit of time with them preparing for this, but even with that familiarity with them, I, I do kind of look at a lot of the numbers in here and go, that's crazy. Um, and speaking of crazy, um, I, I do want to kind of touch a little bit, you know, I've I said before, and I'll say again, this is a, a presentation that does focus on, on workplace applications, but I do think consumer attitudes are important. And the reality is that right now, generative AI is a technology that is, you know, at best regarded warily by consumers. It's certainly not been embraced unquestioningly. So uh, to illustrate this, I, I turned to some data that I gathered from Ipsos, which has been asking panels of, of Americans every month uh, the same set of questions about a, a number of topics, including generative AI. 
And one of the questions they ask is, if you found out that consumer product X was being produced uh, with more input and more involvement from generative AI, would, would that realization make you trust the product more or less? And what you can see in the bars at the right is it has actually driven a pretty substantial increase in distrust. And I think what's really notable is that you know, if you look at something like user reviews or or influencers, it's it's not hard to understand why people would would f- get a little bit leery of something like that. Implicitly, people gravitate to influencers or they trust user reviews because they feel confident that it's a real person on the other side of the screen. Someone really picked up a product and said, "Oh, this does do the job properly," or an influencer showed me a place and made me really want to go there. So you don't necessarily want software uh, getting in the middle of that. But if you look at something like TV advertising, which I think even the most credulous consumer understands is a product that is calibrated and optimized carefully to manipulate people or you know convince them to do something, even with that understanding, there is still a growth in distrust of it if they find out that Gen AI is involved. I think this it's this is obviously a very early stage in everybody thinking about this technology and, and how it can be used and how it what role it will play. So these numbers are going to change over time, but I do think that the present unease around this technology is something that must be thought about very intently um, at every organization that's considering using it, whether the uses are completely internal or whether they're customer facing. Um, but I did say that this is a, a workplace technology first and foremost, right? And so while we might be leery of it as consumers, at the office, it's a different story. So I decided to gather up some data here from Pew, which asked, uh, cons- or rather professionals in lots of different uh, industries, whether they thought generative AI was going to help or, or hurt uh, more overall. And I sorted uh, these industries by their level of distrust in the technology. And I think what's really important is to point out is that the top four industries rated this way are by far the least exposed to generative AI. Um, you know, retail trade, transportation, agriculture. There's probably a world in which generative AI plays a meaningful role in what those industries do, but right now it does not. And yet anxiety in those industries is much, much higher than it is for industries that are already exposed to it. And what I think that that tells everybody is that once you play around with generative AI, it becomes quickly apparent what it can do and the opportunity it presents, but also its shortcomings. Um, and so I, th- I don't think it's an accident that if you look at information and technology, the, the category at the bottom, you find not only the lowest level of apprehension about it, just 11% think it will hurt more than help, but also the lowest number of undecided people as well. There's you know basically eight in 10 of the respondents in that field feel like they understand what kind of impact Gen AI is going to have um, on their industries. And I, I think that this is a good segue into understanding that, you know, once you understand what Gen AI can and can't do, you start to feel comfortable about understanding how much autonomy you want to give it. So, you know, one of the, the biggest fears, the kind of sci-fi nightmare scenarios about Gen AI is giving it too much autonomy. Uh, you know, you take your hands off the controls and all of a sudden we're in the middle of World War III. Um, but I think that what's notable is that in countries where AI penetration is highest, uh, trust in the technology is also highest. So KPMG asked professionals in countries all over the world a bunch of different questions about how exposed to Gen AI they were at work, how much they trusted it. And they another question they asked is, you know, in an ideal scenario, what's the division, what's the balance uh, between human and and Gen AI in managerial decision making? And this, the thing that really leapt out at me is that in the countries with the highest Gen AI penetration, which are, um, for those of you that, that don't feel like squinting, uh, Brazil, India, China, and South Africa, the share that would be comfortable with more than 50% of the decision making being done by AI that that share is twice as high as it is in any other country in the world. And if you add in the chunk that says, I'm fine with a 50-50 split, half man, half machine, you get to a majority, which I think is truly incredible for a technology that you know most people didn't know existed uh, 10 months ago. And so I think that in addition to sort of telling us a lot about how much trust we all have in this technology, it, it says, I think, a lot about 
how easy it is to sort of find a role and uh, find a purpose for this technology, no matter what country, no matter what industry you work in. And that I think is a good segue into talking about business use cases. So we're going to dwell a little bit on, um, you know, the kind of goals folks have for the technology. We'll look a little bit at the sort of expected uses, um, judging by, you know, money that's being invested in the sector, um, as I said, uh, via venture capital, for example. So, um, but a quick refresher. So right now we're looking at about 45 million people uh, in the US using Gen AI at work. Um, over the next two years, that number is going to grow 87% to about 83 million people. And I bring this back, not just as a sort of uh, level setter, but also just to sort of underline the fact that that kind of growth is just not possible if you're only using generative AI for one thing. It has lots of uh, use cases that have been identified already. Um, and it's also too, I think this is important to underline, being used um, probably more in, in ways that uh, alarmists wouldn't have expected. So um, McKinsey surveyed lots of different professionals earlier in the year about how uh, AI, Gen AI is being used at their organizations. And uh, it separated its responders out into AI, people that worked at what are called AI high performers, which are companies that drove at least a fifth of their uh, EBIT using Gen AI in some form or fashion, and everybody else. And what I think is really interesting when you look at the responses of how the AI high performers are using it is, yes, driving kind of more revenue from the core business is a big part of it, but nearly a quarter of these respondents are using this technology to essentially build entirely new businesses, which speaks to the sort of um, you know productive capacity of this technology. Um, but even if you look at the uh, the other respondent group, uh, what you still see is that sixty, basically two thirds of respondents are using this to sort of drive production rather than immediately viewing Gen AI as a scalpel used to you know cut costs or trim fat. So again, let's now dive into sort of you know the business use cases. So Cap Gemini, um, I believe this was earlier this summer, asked a bunch of organizations, uh, executives at organizations, what they could see as top use cases for Gen AI. And what really leaps out, I think, is just how many are were identified by large percentages of the respondents. Um, there were five different function areas that at least a quarter of respondents identified as top use cases. And these range from 3D printing to, you know, IT to marketing and communications. And this is, I think, impressive in and of itself. But I, I think it also sort of undersells the scope of adoption in certain verticals. So, for example, marketing and communications was identified as a use case by a little less than half of the respondents. But if you talk to marketers as a group, uh, more than three quarters of marketers are now using Gen AI on a regular basis. Um, a significant portion are, are literally using it at their jobs every single day already. And so I think it's important to understand that even though this sort of captures the, the breadth of how this technology is being used, it doesn't speak to the depth. Um, and, you know, your ability to sort of uncover that and the mileage will vary depending on the vertical you're in. But if you think about the specific applications, which is sort of you know a layer down from uh, the use cases, you you get an even clearer picture. So I think it's important to note, not just not to uh, get too off track, but of the eleven uh, applications listed here, seven of the eleven are consumer facing. So as a sort of to bring back an earlier through line, it is important to think a little bit about you know how consumer leeriness or, or attitude toward the technology will shape whether you use this. But I think also, too, when you look at this list, what you see is uh, basically an entire list of uh, uses that are crying out for, you know, a new generation of, of software and, and application interfaces and basically layers that allow you into leveraging and playing with data in a, in a whole new way. And so even though there's been all this conversation around prompt engineering as an essential skill for workers, I really think that you know prompt engineering is not going to matter very much at all in about five years because there will have been this entirely new bumper crop of technologies that people with minimal 
training can can get into with their jobs and and use to you know query data sets or engage with customers or spin up uh you know a b tests and things like that so and i think so this is also fundamental on, on that point i just wanted to jump in and say yeah i mean i i subscribe to a newsletter that comes out every day it's only focused on a, uh, generative ai and every day it lists new companies uh, that are offering new slices and dices of ways that you can uh, ai can be used um you know specifically for research in a particular uh, area or specifically for a social media use case that is extremely precise and you, you know using a very small slice of the data set so i really think your point about prompt engineering being kind of a uh, a limited window of opportunity is is really spot on. I, I feel like there's going to be more and more uh, opportunities for uh, companies to spring up and then for businesses to to use those companies' resources to really hone in on the generative AI use cases that fit them the best. I mean, it, it's really remarkable how quickly this is all, all developed, don't you think? Oh, 100%. Uh, tons of venture capital helps, obviously. So, um... Here we have a uh, breakdown of basically the categories of investment uh, in generative AI that have been happening recently. This is CB Insights data, and it's it's a, over a year old, but I, I chose data that was over a year old partly because a company that's received investment two years ago is going to be further along in its go-to-market strategy and might have uh, developed more penetration in its among its addressable audience versus a you know a company that might have raised an angel round or a series A six months ago where it's less clear you know what the timeline is for them to go to market. So there's a lot of numbers in this table, a lot of text. Um, you can pour over this when you get the slides after the presentation. but I think the important thing to sort of home in on here is a lot of people will kind of gravitate uh, toward the text and, and visual media investments. but to me, the most important thing here is the uh, more than half a billion dollars that was invested into generative interfaces. And this is, again, sort of the like foundation of a new generation of, of working tools and um, points of, of contact, um, not just between businesses and data, but also businesses and consumers. And I think we're at the very, very beginning of, of having that radically transform the way that we think about how we spend that money. Um, but before we kind of get too far ahead of ourselves, I do want to talk a little bit about the stuff that's um, you know in our way on the on this highway forward. Again, I wouldn't call you know I'm not trying to be alarmist or or, or cynical, but it, it is worth pointing out that there are things that you know uh, deserve the attention of people that want to invest in and engage with this technology. Um, these are all I think familiar to all of you, you know, in a kind of abstract way, and we'll we'll dive into them. We'll start with the the gaps between risk and mitigation. So this is referring again to that McKinsey survey that I uh, mentioned a few slides ago. But they asked respondents to essentially identify all the ways in which their organizations see generative AI posing a potential risk to their organizations. And it asked those same respondents, what, if anything, are you doing to, to mitigate against those risks? And what leaps out at you really right away is the gigantic gaps between identified risk and mitigating. Um, this is, to my mind, a natural thing. It's not neglectful. Uh, you know, even though, as I was saying before, there's a lot that's gone on in business and technology and our lives that sort of made it easier for us to jump onto generative AI right away and start playing with it and incorporating it. It's still a brand new technology. And so all the chief legal officers and general counsels and um, CIOs are, are all still wrapping their arms around, you know, all the ways in which a corporation might, you know, prevent or fight the misuse of its IP by an LLM, for example. And there's that that's the tip of a gigantic iceberg that everyone will be kind of dealing with for quite a while. Um, but I do want to sort of underline that, you know, just because this is a sort of natural point in an evolution, it doesn't mean that you should ignore it or put your head in the sand about it, uh, because closing these gaps is a high priority. And uh, speaking of high priorities, uh, we should talk about reskilling a little bit. I'm sure that's something that all of you have thought about at least a little bit. You know, is generative AI going to take my job? Is it going to force me to relearn how to do my job? Is it going to transform the expectations my manager has about my output and my productivity? Um, and the answer, as you can see from this chart a little bit, is 
potentially. So here again, McKinsey uh, broke out the answers from people that worked at companies at the AI high performers and people that worked everywhere else. And what you know becomes clear right away is that once you figure out what chat GPT can do, it does sort of force you to rethink how you do what you are doing. Um, and the implications of that are going to are going to differ uh, based on the industry, based on the on the company, and so on and so forth. Um, but I do want to also call out something else from this chart, which is this sort of suspiciously even distribution of answers in the second chart. Uh, this to me says essentially that the folks that haven't started using AI much at their jobs kind of don't know what they don't know um, and didn't feel, I guess, confident enough to uh, indicate that they don't know. So I think the big takeaway here is that substantial and significant reskilling is is probably coming for all of us. The scope of it is going to differ, but just, you know, file that away. Um, and then finally, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the reality is that even if this is a workplace first technology, even if this is principally something that is used to drive productivity across business, it's not going to realize the potential, the full potential that it has if it's viewed as malevolent or something that's evil or something that's, you know, going to bring about the death of civilization. I'm speaking in an extreme fashion, but, you know, when you're dealing with consumer attitudes, sometimes that's helpful. And so it's going to be very important moving forward that every business that wants to use Gen AI has to think really hard about, um, you know, what this anxiety means and how to respond to it. And that's a good segue into my takeaways. So, you know, the first thing is just to close the deltas. There's naturally going to be a big gap between understanding, oh, this is something that's a big risk and, oh, but we can do this with it. Um the ways in which businesses, until a corpus of sort of best practices emerges, the the approaches to to closing these gaps is going to be highly individualized. Uh, but it's important that everybody kind of, you know, jump in with two feet and try to work on it right away. The second thing, again, really does focus on uh, developing a strong POV on how forthcoming to be about generative AI and its role. There was this really great piece in the journal about a week ago which showed how CMOs are, you know, generally torn about how how forward they want to be about explaining that generative AI is part of their their communications or the product that they make. And, you know, I think there's certain brands that, um, you know, if the kind of core tenet or promise of your brand is being, you know, really bleeding edge, really advanced, really technical. Um, there's maybe some brownie points to be won by saying, you know, by letting on that, the chatbot is 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 run by Gen AI, but if your if your brand is a little more homespun, a little uh, more kind of modest and traditional in its uh, in its personality, it potentially costs you customers or or you know damages risks your reputation in some way. And so, getting a, a firm grip and a firm, as I said, POV on what to do here is going to be absolutely essential in the near term. And then the final thing is just to make it part of the culture. You know, I think that one of the things that's emerged in this presentation is just that generative AI touches on on lots of things. It, it affects how we work. It affects, uh, you know, what we use to do our work. It affects the cultural products we consume. It affects, uh, you know, it has implications for sort of where all industries to a certain extent are going. And with that level of excitement and, 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 anxiety, it's absolutely essential that organizations allow everybody in the organization to sort of play a role in, in figuring that out and harnessing that promise. If you make all the decisions about what our policy on this is, which products we're going to use there is, if it's all done by the C-suite behind closed doors, it's going to raise anxiety. It's not going to diminish it. And so creating a culture where everybody feels like they have a role to play in figuring this out is going to be absolutely essential. And uh, that about does it for me. So um, back to you, Debbie. Oh my gosh, Max, that was amazing. I mean, generative AI is such a profound technology in so many ways. And I mean, I'm just amazed at all of the really profound business cases, as well as the the big challenges that you've, you've isolated. Um, I personally have so many questions for you, but um, I know that you guys do it as well who are listening. And I want you to continue to add questions on the right side of the video screen because we will try to get to as many of them as we can. But first, I want to bring back our special guest, Christian Ward. 
Uh, Christian is the Chief Data Officer of Yext. So uh, welcome back, Christian. Thank you, Debbie, and great job, Max. Oh my gosh, absolutely. But, you know, I really have a, so, some questions for you that I wanted to go over. Um, so, you know, one of them is that uh, we, we saw that in, in Max's presentation that nearly half of executives worldwide are deploying generative AI for, for sales and marketing. It's obviously like one of the biggest use cases. And so I'm curious to know what you think some of the measurable outcomes are that could underscore its value. And then from there, um, the bigger question maybe in my mind is how do you measure the ROI? That, that's like a question that keeps coming up with every new technology that seems to come out. Absolutely. Uh, and it's it's a great question, right? Because I think it's, as Max is pointing out, it's really early in this, right? So everyone's just starting to get their arms around this. Um, there are different adoption levels by industry. Um, but I, I think this is going to be measured, at least it, it's going to start to be measured in one way, and it's going to transform very quickly into another way. And, and essentially what I think you're going to see is Today, when we think about most brands or businesses that are using generative AI, they're thinking about it from the monologue perspective, right? Like, let's generate a million blog posts and get found in Google for every topic under the sun. Um, and they're going to push content um, very, very aggressively. They might even use personal information to try and change and to generate a personal interaction, but it's still going to feel and be measured probably by the increase in um, sort of efficiency or number of content pieces that are put out there. Um, and, and that's okay. That's that's typically how marketers measure everything is like, how much can I push the brand message? Um, but, but that's actually not where this is going. Uh, what's going to happen very quickly after that is people are going to recognize that this is the moment and this technology creates the moment of opportunity to move from monologues to dialogues at scale. And what that means is we are going to start to measure the ROI of every conversation between an AI, a fully AI experience, an AI plus human experience, and a strictly human experience. Because what we've all always wanted as brands and businesses was a way to scale a great conversation between our business and the consumer. So that's going to move so that the ROI actually will analyze and we'll use the same technology to do it. How well did that conversation go? Did I help the client? Did I waste time? All of that is going to speed up an ROI calculation on dialogue. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's so important. And I mean, for me, the bottom line is you think about a service like ChatGPT, it's a conversation. It's got the word chat yes. built into the name. So of course <laughs> it's a dialogue, right? Uh, yes. and, and we mentioned, and Max men mentioned chatbots early on. I mean, these are the ex experiences that people are used to having. I feel like this is something that I think people are going to uh, expect is to have a conversation and measuring it based on, a, on, on the value of that conversation to your business. I believe absolutely the, the best way to go. Uh, another area that I think that's come up, though, is uh, Max presented some really compelling data on the adoption of generative AI. And I know we've gotten some great questions about that as well coming in. But, you know, one specifically for you right now is looking at what Max presented about how rapidly generative AI has grown compared to things like mobile or, uh, you know, mobile phones or tablets or even social media, my coverage area. Um, th there seems to be like no end to the, to the growth of this. Um, but I wonder now if we, if you can think about for a second, what the investments mean. So like, where do we see future investments going based on how quickly generative AI is growing? Yeah. So, so first off, um, I, I understand why we measure adoption, um, but I, I actually think it's, it's a, a, the wrong way to think about this technology. Um, I don't actually think it's being adopted. Uh, meaning um, adoption implies the church, as, Mar as Max actually pointed out, adoption implies like the smartphone really took off when Apple made the iPhone so accessible that anyone could figure out because it was intuitive. And so it was really the interface that created the smartphone adoption because a lot of the things, the technology disappeared to us as humans, meaning it just became natural. Um, what's absolutely fascinating about generative AI is we're, it, we're, we're not adopting it. Generative AI is, is machines adopting us, right? So, so what's happening is, is instead of us fighting with it, like how many of you in the audience walk around 
around your house uh, doing something where you're like uh, Gen AI eMarketer conference webinar, look up now. Nobody talks like that. We talk completely naturally and the AI is now able to understand us. So as Max pointed out, people are investing in prompt engineering. They call it prompt wrangling. All that stuff's wrong, right? Because it's only going to understand us more and more. So the exciting part about where this goes is not that adoption curve. It's that this is allowing us to adopt so many other technologies. In other words, it used to be that humans that were computer savvy had an advantage. What just happened is that now that machines are human savvy, that advantage is gone. So it's going to open up a whole new world of how we engage with machines and what it means to actually do our jobs as long as we can access authoritative information in that process. You know, you talk about engaging with machines and 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 consumers engaging with machines, and that really, honestly, Christian brings me back to this topic of trust, mm -hmm. uh, which again Max talked about quite extensively in the presentation. Uh, you know, some of the surveys that we saw suggest consumer trust in companies using AI or like influencers using AI is heading is is negative. And yeah. he, Max also talked about how we need to turn that around. But um, I'm curious to know what you think are some of the solutions for that. Um, how can businesses address these concerns? Um, you know, especially some of those businesses that have really high AI exposure. Uh, it seems like it's got to be a big issue to overcome. Yeah, look, I, trust is a fascinating topic, right? In all academic research, we always think of trust. Uh, fundamentally, it's it's actually, it's, it's both emotional and, and chemical, right? Trust is the release of oxytocin in the brain after having an interaction. And it builds over time based on interactions. Well, what are interactions? Well, they're dialogues. For most humans, the reason why we trust something is that we have dialogues and we actually get value out of the dialogue. Anyone that's tried a chatbot in the last 10 years has probably hated it because it's not a dialogue. It was a glorified if-then loop tree, right? What this is doing is, is opening the opportunity for actually having humans reach that trust level. Trust so from an aversion perspective, I think the best way to think about it is you, you need to draw a continuum, right? There's objective information and there's subject information, subjective. I think the subjective is where we're going to lose a lot of trust with generative AI. So reviews, product reviews, uh, you know, restaurant reviews, that stuff's going to absolutely get destroyed by this in terms of amount of overage and, and sort of misleading content. But in terms of objective data, data where you have this information where the business itself, similar to what we do at Yex, but that the business or the, the authority is saying, this is the answer to that question. That has a magical opportunity to build trust. And most people, I think, will see that this technology is going to disappear. In fact, it's kind of already disappeared. People don't even know how much they're using Gen AI already, just in their daily experience of using search or chat. So so I think the trust will come very quickly on the objective factual side, and I think it will degrade horribly quickly, uh, at least to start in the subjective side. Yeah, really good point. And it's reminding me of uh, not too long ago, I'm I'm planning a trip to Sicily in a couple of weeks. And um, I went on to ChatGPT and I asked it to recommend restaurants in the town that I'm going to be staying in. And I got back a really great list. And, you know, of course, it happened in like two seconds, right? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, but then I kind of went, okay, well, now I need to look at Yelp and I need to look at TripAdvisor because I don't know if these recommendations are good or not. I don't know where they came from. Really yes. fascinating. So, yeah. um, you know, on this topic, though, of, of consumer trust, I mean, I think the, the other side of it is legal compliance, right? And so you've got these kind of two twin areas that companies need to focus on, um, trust and legal compliance. So I am, I, I, I'd love to ask you what you think some of the strategies are for businesses to employ, um, you know, to overcome some of those hurdles and, uh, you know, focusing on specifically the ethical side of it, you know, how can they, how can they encourage proper and ethical usage of generative AI? Yes, and it, this is this is probably the most important question. I think most businesses need to really take a step back, which is I want them to realize something very important. Their AI strategy is actually just their data strategy. Very few people on this call uh, are, are likely to have the AI data science department to create your own AI. Um, what you're actually going to do is you're going to try different AI components 
but you need your data in a format and a structure where there's a compliance element to that. See, people right now, they're, they're going about this all wrong, they're, and, and humbly, which is they're just hooking it up to their website or they're hooking it up to their data lake. That is a really bad idea. You should not let a large language model into your data lake. What you should be doing is setting up a lockbox compliance and legally workflow approved set of knowledge that then you try different AI systems to see if you can get the outcomes that you're looking for. But it absolutely needs to be in its own area. It needs to be safe. Um, but that will allow, at least for businesses, for them to put objective facts about their business in a place where they can then prove the compliance arm. Because look, Article 22 of GDPR in Europe already covers this, that if you can't explain why an algorithm made a choice for Max that was different than for me and different for you, Debbie, you're in a lot of trouble. And so this allows you to say, no, I know exactly where the knowledge came from. That's the answer that that human got. And here's why that's going to be really important. So I think for everyone here, it's really focusing on how do you get your data into the right strategic position to leverage AI responsibly? And that's what we should all be focusing on. That's a great way to, 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 to end that part of it. But thank you, Christian. I, but we want to get to some of our audience Q&As as well. We've definitely received a lot of great questions. So um, I would like to bring back Max. And um, yeah, I don't. it's hard to know where to begin with all the questions here, but I'm going to take a quick look here. Um, honestly, I think I want to start pretty broad because... Um, We've gotten several questions that go back to the beginning of your presentation, Max, where you talked about consumer adoption of AI and uh, how quickly it's growing. Um, there's some nuances to that that I think some of the members of the audience want to explore. So, um, you know, one of those I think is, um, do you think, and I'll, I'll direct this to you, Max, but Christian, please feel free to weigh in if you'd like to as well. Um, but Max, do you think that AI adoption will flatten or decrease even given the quick adoption that we're seeing right now? To a, an extent, that's an inevitability, right? I mean, eventually it will reach a, a kind of saturation point uh, in the workplace and uh, will naturally level off. I think that there are lots, you know, to return to one of the slides that I showed earlier, th there are industries that are far less exposed to this technology than others. I don't think that we're at all in danger of getting to a place where, you know, the people that work in, you know, uh, in a department store or work uh, in a highly human facing role are, are potentially at risk of, of having to incorporate this technology in some way. And so it is in some ways a numbers game. But I also think that, you know, even though our, our forecasting team rather prudently cut their forecast off at 2025, I do think that we're in the middle of, you know, the, a growth uh, phase rather than a, a more mature uh, growth trajectory. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I agree. I think the saturation is probably definitely true. I would also say this is being adopted so rapidly behind the scenes. Literally every platform out there is launching their co-pilot. So for every business marketer, you've got 20 platforms you work with daily. You're just going to be talking to it very, very shortly. I'd say by the end of the year, most of them will have something like that. Um, so that's where you won't necessarily see the same the numbers but but the saturation is almost in everything you do. Um, and I think that's very likely to happen quickly. Um, but what's also really interesting in this is, I, I think it's hard to look at this technology in particular and not see the ramifications for every industry when it comes to education. So we talk about things like agriculture or others, being able to talk to the land through the AI and the data that's in the land of how much rainfall, what's the weather, what's the humidity, being able to have those conversations, that is the natural human state, is to have ongoing dialogues and, and interactions. So this will be one of the fastest disappearing technologies because, and that's a Stephen Levy concept of, you know, you don't carry a camera anymore because it's in your phone, it disappeared, right? Well, this will probably be the fastest disappearing technology we've seen to date. Well, you know, you said the words talk to the land. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, where are we going with that? But I totally <laughs> understand it. Um, but, you know, honestly, though, I think sometimes people, uh, you know, think that there's a lot, there's too much hype about generative AI. And we've got another really great question. Um, Max, maybe I'll take this one to you to start with as well. Uh, but the, 
the the person wants to know uh, where do you stand regarding the idea that AI and generative AI are currently within the period of the peak of inflated expectations, mm-hmm. uh, and they reference the Gartner hype cycle. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Max, do you think I'll start with you on that one? Um, do you think generative AI may be the one technology that maybe might not? fit in when the, into this hype cycle or are we like very much in it right now? It kind of feels like it go both ways for me personally. Yeah. I mean, I think what's, what's notable about this technology is the, in some senses that we've already, I think kind of modulated our expectations a little bit. Um, anybody who, you know, hears about generative AI and then, you know, spends an afternoon playing with it can, can quickly kind of recalibrate their expectations of, what this is capable of doing. And so um, I'm not a, you know, uh, an expert on what uh, on the Gartner hype cycle specifically, but I, I do think that the the general idea is that because it's so easy to kind of get feedback and and analyze the uh, the output of this technology, it's probably easier to say that we have, we're more like gaining a, a better understanding of what it's capable of. I don't know that we're necessarily at an inflated expectation point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a great point because um, I love the conversation around hype because it, very few technologies that I've seen in my lifetime have advanced as quickly. Uh, so AI is actually today the worst it's ever going to be. And it's moving at a speed faster than I think the hype actually can keep up with. The other thing that I love about the Gartner hype cycle, if everyone's seen it before, it's sort of this chart and it goes like this. That's also the Dunning-Kruger curve, which is the more competent people are on a topic, um, the more conf- there's a confidence level. So as people lo- learn a little bit, they get really confident about what it can do. That's the hype. But then as they learn more exactly what it can do, it changes where they they lose faith. I think what you'll see is we're going to go through that. But because the AI is also advancing, like literally today, there's now an open public uh, tool for putting text into AI generated content, which up until now, Dolly and uh, um, uh, Stable Diffusion, a lot of these technologies were was not a, was not a thing. It's now here, so you can have the AI generate everything and connect it directly to like a Canva account. That's moving so fast. I don't know that we're actually going to catch that wave. I think it's very much um, worthy of the hype, but also it's advancing very very quickly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you know what? I, I honestly we're we're getting more and more questions having to somehow touching on on hype and the the rate of adoption. So I, I think I just want to continue on this track and uh, turn it back over to Max with this one. Uh, so the the question is uh, regarding mass early adoption. Um, you know, people who are testing or sampling, or uh, whether from work related reasons or maybe maybe consumer related reasons, uh, testing out different uh, generative AI technologies. Um, they're wondering is this going to impact use later on? Um, for example, like if you try it and uh, it doesn't yield what people want, they say, or or is maybe not helping you as much right now. Are you less likely to use it? Is it maybe maybe to rephrase it? Is this kind of a technology where um, if you get bad results early on or maybe not results that, that you don't want, are you going to get turned off and then decide, oh, it just isn't for me, um, whether that, again, whether that's for my business or whether that's as a consumer? I think it's a really important question. And it, it really kind of depends on the, the time frame that you attach to it. You know, I think that there's a lot of potential for people to, you know, try it out for one specific use case, maybe, uh, you know, find get a result back that's not satisfactory or maybe you know not not promise delivering on the promise of it but the the reality is that this technology can be used in so many different ways that maybe you think okay I don't love it for this but I should try it for that or you know I should do it for this and then also too you add in uh what Christian alluded to which is just the like breakneck pace of the evolution of some of the the models and the the interfaces themselves and so you know, I know from my own experience that, you know, I, I tried to do a couple things with uh, 3.5, ChatGPT 3.5, and wasn't super thrilled with what I got back. But when they announced that they had come out with four, I thought, okay, well, I got to try it now. And there's that, that, that sequence or a version of it is going to play out dozens of times over the next couple of years. So it, it again, sort of depends on the uh, time frame that you're thinking about it on. But I think that broadly, there'll be lots of moments like that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about too, I mean, just in the past, I mean, you know, this is decades ago now, but when search came out, you know, search was not very good. Like we didn't, you know, we didn't get uh, the results we wanted. Sometimes we still don't. Right. But, um, you know, it got better. The company's improved on it. Um, Consumers certainly still love using search and it's continuing to grow. I mean, I know um, you and your colleagues have been writing about how search is evolving and changing. And I feel like what you just said about generative AI really rings true for me. I mean, we're really going to see a lot of development that, um, you know, if at first it doesn't succeed, um, the, the try, try again mantra, I believe, is going to continue to work. Early um, search is a great, is, great comp. Yeah. yeah, search is such a great way to think about it as well, because the number one digital experience for any company ever is Google. And it's a single empty box on a blank page. It literally doesn't offer you anything else except to start a dialogue. And I, I would say to your point, chat, chat's been terrible. Like most chats are terrible. They're already infinitely better than they were even two years ago based on this technology. So I, I think to your point, I think some people will sour a little bit, but this is moving so quickly and your jobs will force you to use the technology. You're just going to see it everywhere very quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, um, I, I, we've got a couple of questions about the specific uses of uh, of, of generative AI. Um, and and uh, one use case in particular that's come up here is B2B content creation. Uh, and so the question here is about uh, whether you think mistrust is going to extend to this area of B2B content creation. Um, I, I, I'll take this one to Max as well, but um, I guess I think it also has ramifications for any type of content creation, not just B2B. I mean, you've, you've got a lot of, uh, you know, potential for mistrust across uh, all the content that might be generated through generative AI. Oh, 100%. I mean, there are bad actors, you know, there's there are bad marketers everywhere, whether they're aiming to reach a consumer audience or a business audience. And so I think that there's the potential for a bit more, you know, chaff to be introduced into the these ecosystems. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, nobody, nobody signs a you know, a contract for for money based on just reading a white paper and not doing any further research. So uh, I think that there's we're at the very beginning of, of starting to kind of understand what it means that content can be created at this scale. But uh, I don't know that it's going to be particularly worse or or better for uh, B2B audiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for yeah sure. I'd, I'd love to add to that just that um, one thing that we see is People that are sort of using this tool just to put a shout content, I think they're going to be really upset also in terms of not only does the human not find it interesting, but I don't think the search engines are going to find it particularly interesting because the 8 millionth blog post on summer gardening tips is not helping anyone. However, if you have your data, your knowledge, your objective facts, and you use the AI and say, using this knowledge that is stored and is compliant I want you to write a blog post about summer gardening and include the products, the services, where you can get them, include facts. If you use AI uh, as the cement between bricks of knowledge to create a narrative, those actually do phenomenally well because they're high quality and they have real knowledge in them. If instead your wall looks like poured cement with two bricks in it, you're going to have a problem. And, and the search engines and others are going to know that balance. So I think it's really about using, again, getting your data and your objective facts to use with this as a narration creation. Um, that's where you're going to see the real power of the, of the platform. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we've spent so much time talking about the power of generative AI and and what it can do. Uh, you know, we've got a question here that I think actually takes the opposite tack. Um, Max, what do you think are some of the things you see generative AI being not so well suited to doing? Um, where, where, yeah, where does where does that go in your mind? I mean, to me, I, I think of generative AI principally as being something that uh, is great at sort of spinning up an MVP of something. It's great to sort of drive th- thought starters to, you know, whip up mock-ups, things like that. And um, and the sort of converse of that is that you probably don't want it to just be in charge of the finished product. Um, and that's that's really where I where my mind goes first is just you don't want it to be the thing. Uh, you don't want to just hit publish once it's it spits b- something back at you. You want to take time to fact check it you want to take time to uh you know maybe f- freshen up what it what it tells you or or what it presents to you but that's that's mainly where my where my mind goes is you want to have a human layer of uh you know 
quality assurance essentially before it goes out the front door. Yeah, it's so important to have that, that human layer, right? I mean, I, I can't, <laughs> I, I, I would hate for, and again, going back to the idea that, uh, you know, generative AI, someone asked earlier, um, you know, are there, do people, do we run the risk of people not having a good experience? Um, you know, if, if you're rushing the content out uh, without that human layer, I mean, I think that's that's really, really a big challenge. Uh, well, you know, it's also going to be a huge compliance issue, um, Debbie. I mean, if 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 you don't have that human, um, the moment this thing says something, I mean, there are a lot of companies dealing with this already. To get today, um, I, and and on that question, the reality is we know large language models are not good at like who, what, where, when, uh, pulling back like a database. Like even Sam Altman's pointed this out. Like, don't ask it what time Wendy's opens. That's a bad use of that generative AI. So it's going to get it wrong, or it's going to make it up. It's a statistical probabilistic outcome of words. It is not a database. What it's phenomenal at is a reasoning engine or a narration or a translation. And so if you use it for that, I think you're going to really be pleased with it. But you've got to, again, have uh, your data approach a very separate model for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, just one last real quick question that, um, you know, I just want to throw in just because I think it's it's fun and I'm curious. I mean, I hope our audience is as well. Um, Max, uh, thinking back to today, yesterday or whatever, um, what is the most recent thing that you used personally, you use generative AI for? I, uh, the other day, actually used it for uh, a recipe. I often i'm the one who does all the cooking in my house and uh i definitely have kind of go to um you know sites and i have a couple subscriptions that i i go to that have these you know libraries of recipes but every once in a while i like to just sort of you know pop open uh chat gpt and ask it you know i've got this 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 and this in my refrigerator what can i do with it and um even though it's uh you know you have to sort of scrutinize it a little bit i i'm always amused by sort of what it spits back out at me because it, in a way it kind of does what i will often do where i'll maybe look at three or four recipes and think about it and go oh that one looks under seasoned or this one you know probably isn't going to give me the color i want so let me kind of mix these together and so um i use it for that all the time that's awesome next time i see you in person we're going to have to t exchange some cooking tips christian what was the last time you used generative ai uh, so, to, so today, um, I've been experimenting with uh, generative AI in sort of image creation for uh, blog posts and tweets, uh, because I think that's a fascinating area and it can really help people scale. Um, and then uh, more broadly, I tend to use GPT uh, with Code Interpreter um, on a daily basis to explore data sets. Um, so many of the charts and graphs that you have here today, if you have the files, you can try them um, and, and actually interrogate the data, asking the large language model, hey, can you render me 12 different charts about something that's interesting in this data set? And it's actually quite impressive uh, and seems to be getting better every day. So there's, there's just... There's countless ways to mess with this stuff. That That is really awesome. For, for me, it was helping to plan the Sicily trip. So I had it come up <laughs> with a, a full seven-day itinerary for me. And uh, then I impressed all my friends, uh, making them think that I planned it myself. But anyway, we won't get into that. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you, Max, for joining us. And a special thank you to you, Christian, and to the team at EXT. Uh, our studio II crew, uh, the eMarketer production team, also really deserves a huge thank you for making this webinar possible. Uh, as promised, we'll be emailing you a link to today's slides along with the full recording of the session. So please keep an eye on your inbox for that. Uh, but before we wrap up, I just want to take a, um, a quick moment to tell you a little bit more about what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. Uh, we have more live analyst and tech talk webinars coming up. You can register for those at emarketer.com slash webinars. On the audio side, we have the Behind the Numbers podcast, which I will personally say is one of my favorite things to do here at Insider Intelligence and eMarketer as an analyst, where you can find that anywhere you can listen to podcasts. And finally, we have our newsletters. So we have a number of options covering digital marketing, retail, and finance. So there's something for everyone, and you can sign up at emarketer.com slash newsletters. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your work day.